We were talking earlier about the uh, gross misconduct of people on this breakfast show shooting a salt gun at a doll or an effigy of Donald Trump and encouraging other people to do the same. And I suggested, who could you shoot a salt gun at on some very lightweight national television, taxpayer-funded television programme and get away with it? And one of the people I came up with, a lot of people said Adolf Hitler, I said Vladimir Putin. You could probably universally shoot a salt gun at Vladimir Putin in this day and age and in this country and get away with it without anyone criticising you. Um, which is kind of a lead and not a particularly good segue into uh, our, our, our next guest, um, and no stranger to us, Robert Patman, our, our resident expert on things international, and in particular the unfolding um, situation in the Ukraine, which we haven't checked out since we've been back on air. So Robert Patman joins us um, from what I always think is the archetypal sort of study, academic study, surrounded by books and paper, a certain air of chaos about it. But Robert's sitting there <laughs> like a great doyen in the middle of it all. How are you? Happy New Year, Robert. Nice to see you again. Happy New Year, Sean. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. All right, you do need a better filing system, or is that kind of organised chaos? You know where everything is. Well, I guess so, yeah. It's, I'm at home, and it's my study at home, so it's, yeah, pretty chaotic, but I know where everything is, believe oh. it or not. All right, look, I kind of news black out myself over Christmas, and the only thing I've been aware of recently is some American military intelligence claims that the toll for the war in Ukraine uh, with the Russians, 150,000 casualties, which seems enormous. Mm. But before we get into that, what is the situation on the ground at the moment in Ukraine? They're in the middle of winter, aren't they? Yes, and it's been, I think, largely one of stalemate, but the Russians have made some progress. They've taken a town called Soldar, uh, and also uh, this has put in jeopardy uh, another flashpoint between the Ukrainians and the Russians, a place called Bakhmut, where the Wagner Group, this is this mercenary group, uh, with semi-official blessing from Vladimir Putin, have been pressing to try to... They've been trying to get Bakhmut for about six months. Um, it has some strategic significance. So there is some concern there amongst the Ukrainians that the loss of Soldar has now put Bakhmut in the in the crosshair, so to speak, but not huge movement. Um, so basically, the Ukrainians have retained much of the territory that they gained in that impressive counteroffensive in the last three months of uh, 2022. Right. I, I also note some discussion about the Germans supplying leopard mm. tanks, which I understand are a pretty good piece of kit to the Ukrainians, but that's hit some sort of snag? Yes, the Germans are the second biggest provider of heavy uh, weapons to the Ukrainians after the Americans. But unlike the Americans, the Germans always seem to be quite reluctant and slow to make decisions. The Ukrainians first asked for the Leopard 2 tanks 7th of March of last year. Uh, but they now believe, and so do most of um, Ukraine's allies in NATO, believe that Leopard tanks are crucial. They're probably the most effective battle tank in the world. They'll be more than a match for anything the Russians have. And it's no secret the Russians are preparing a major offensive um, on many fronts with these newly mobilised troops that they, they had a partial mobilisation in September last year and they've been adding to that. So um, I think the, the Ukrainians now feel that if they're going to, I mean, their strategic aim is to seize back Crimea and eject Russian troops from the country. They're going to need something like uh, most strategic experts believe, something like the Leopard 2 tanks to help them do that. Yeah. Uh, Robert, is there a danger in terms of emphasis that the longer this war goes on, the less the rest of the world, and I might use the term the free world, cares about it, that simply by hanging in there, Russia eventually gets concessions or, or gets some sort of limited victory out of this? Um, there is certainly that view that time is on... Uh, Mr. Putin's side. Uh, but he's also, I mean, against that, there's several things. Firstly, 
there does not seem to be any softening of Western support for Ukraine. We've just had a meeting at Rammstein in Germany uh, where there's been huge pledges of heavy military weapons and they're being delivered. So uh, the Americans, for example, have already given $27 billion worth of support to Ukraine since the full-scale invasion began in February last year. Um, they've now chipped in with another 2.5. And it seems that the some of the weaponry the Ukrainians have long been seeking, not just the Leopard 2 tanks, but, for example, Patriot uh, missile defence batteries are now being delivered. So they're beginning to get some really impressive military capabilities. That's bad news for Mr. Putin and also counters the argument that time is on his side. The other thing is, the second factor, which is a counter-argument against time being on Mr. Putin's side, is the, the Russian economy is suffering because of the sanctions. Uh, more than 500 Western companies left uh, Russia or discontinued business there, and that's having a cumulative impact as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, this special military operation, as Mr. Putin termed it, was intended initially to be a blitzkrieg operation and dig uh, the quick swift overrunning of Kiev that didn't happen. So it's, yeah, I mean, there's counter arguments on both sides, arguments on both sides, I should say. The argument that Mr. Putin's got going for him is that he's got much more control over domestic opinion than the counterparts in NATO. And the point you alluded to, Sean, um, is that if this remains a stalemate, if one side doesn't make a breakthrough, um, then maybe there'll be some war weariness amongst the publics of the Western European and yeah. indeed yeah. the United States. Yeah, look, the other thing I did note uh, when I occasionally fell across a newspaper or read something other than a cryptic crossword over the holidays was it would be very hard for any Russian oligarch to get life insurance at the moment. There seems to have been a spate of them falling out of uh, windows, running into bullets backwards. What is going on here? Clearly anyone who, who shows any sign of, of disagreeing with Putin, suddenly they end up dead. Well, yes, there's been a lot of people who've actually been supporters of the regime and very powerful people, uh, business people known as oligarchs who presumably operated with the blessing of Mr Putin, who have, of course, been very worried about the economic consequences uh, this has been, a, I mean, strategic and economic catastrophe for Russia. Uh, isolated Russia um, internationally, but it's set the Russian economy back, arguably, you know, two generations. It, it's a disaster, and it's not going to be easy to get over it. And, of course, I think some of them are very concerned about this. Now, as far as I know, some of the people who fall fallen out of the windows uh, or had other unfortunate accidents... Um, some of them didn't publicly express their views. So that's what's made the whole thing even more intriguing. But uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, there has been a succession of people formerly associated with support for Mr. Putin who've met an unfortunate end. But this is part of a pattern, excuse me, <clears throat> of Mr. Putin's leadership. Um, dissent is not really tolerated. And um, if you persist in dissenting, you normally meet an unfortunate end, whether you be a journalist or whether you... Oh, we have lost him. Oh, we got Robert back. Robert, thank you. Not your fault at all. Um, no an worries. excited next guest who just rang up early and took the line off us. So you were saying there is this strange sort of tendency for people who disagree uh, with Putin to die. Eventually, though, surely if he pursues that... He runs out of people not only to oppose him but to support him and it might strengthen resistance, internal resistance to the Putin regime. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I think Mr Putin's desperate for a military victory because he knows even the loss of Crimea, which he seized in 2014, will probably be the end of the political game for Mr Putin in Moscow. And with authoritarian regimes, you don't get advance warning when there's a a move against the boss, but it could happen. And uh, Mr. Putin's, um, if you like, preemptive measures against people he perceives as disloyal, uh, almost certainly authorised by those around him and certainly himself, um, 
are displays of weakness, not strength. Yeah. And so he's honourable and he knows it. Yeah. And he knows that he's not been winning in Ukraine as well, but he's not going to announce that from the rooftops yeah. either. Yeah, I, so, he should call uh, Jacinda Ardern and say, how do I give, how do I give out of gas, no gas and tank speech? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't think Mr. Putin's ever used to taking a backward step. He also knows there's no comfortable retirement now. Uh, yeah. you know, I don't think there has been for a long time because too many people have met unfortunate ends. And, of course, quite a lot of Russians would give their right arm to, uh, how shall I put it, equal the score up a little yeah. bit. So There's 150,000 casualties as announced by U.S. intelligence analysts. You think it's a realistic figure for the Russian casualty toll in Ukraine? Casualties, possibly. The Ukrainians estimate the deaths as opposed to casualties of Russian troops, about 120,000. Wow. That's um, still a lot of people. It, but what we do know, I think we can safely say, I mean, the Ukrainian figures may be a bit inflated, but what we can safely say is that uh, Russia has sustained more than 100,000 in casualties, and these are horrific figures. Mind you, in the fighting around Soldar and Bakhmut, the Ukrainians have also been uh, experiencing substantial losses, and um, but not on the scale of the Russians. Uh, the, yeah. the problem for the Russians is that They've mobilised a lot of people who've been asked to do the job that the most professional part of the Russian army was unable Couldn't to do, do yeah. which is to basically overrun the Ukrainian army. And they've had, some of them had very poor training and the casualties that the Russians have sustained round Bakhmut and, and taking Soldar have been pretty horrific. Yeah. Uh, Robert, I don't know if you're briefed on this. The other international story we were looking at late last year, and I know is still going on, is the situation um, in Iran. And, and yeah. I don't know, the soft revolution that seems to be going on there. Do you know what the latest is there and where that situation is at? It, it seems, uh, from what, what I can gather, that situation is rumbling on and shows no signs of letting up. Um, and as we said before, the stakes are very high because the protest movement, um, led by women, has increasingly gathered in the support of young men as well. And people 30 and under constitute um, the vast majority of the, uh, I think, 60% of the 80 million population of Iran. So... Uh, the stakes are very high. There's been a lot of deaths. A lot of protesters have been killed. Uh, feelings are running high. And it it hasn't been capturing the headlines in the same way that it did last year. But as far as I can see, the situation is not resolved. And there's no indication the protesters are going to back down lightly. Yeah. Um, particularly with, you know, so many people now having lost their lives, and from the point of view of protesters, innocent people. Yeah. Uh, look, Robert, the other uh, thing just before we go, um, and people have been running around on Twitter saying, oh, I'm banned by Putin for going to Russia. I don't know if I am or not. I didn't have any plans to go to um, St. Petersburg for, for a holiday. Are you banned or not? Are you on the banned list? And does Apparently, it mean I, was, I yeah. was informed on Friday that I was barred from going to Russia. I think mainly because I... I kept confusing what Mr. Putin called a special military operation with what I understand to be an invasion. Um, <laughs> of course, the term invasion is banned in Russia and you can get yeah. a 15-year sentence. So, uh, thankfully, so I'm not in the position you? of getting a 15-year sentence. Who informed you you were banned from Russia? Um, I just I think someone in the media um, oh, okay. There's a list contacted somewhere. me. And, yeah, I, I didn't know about it. Um, I, I mean, I think... You look dreadfully like, you know, concerned, Mark, Robert. I think Ron Mark made Ron Mark made the point of view they should have, more, you know, they must have they must have too much time on their hands because they're you know they're lashing out at people who basically are not going to determine opinion in this country or others. Yeah, and um, it, it it seems like the Russians basically are just trying to change the conversation. They're trying to present themselves the Putin regime, not the Russians. The Putin regime is trying to present itself as the innocent victim in this situation, whereas we all know the tragedy in Ukraine can be be resolved in 24 hours if yeah. Mr Putin 
withdraws Russian forces back to Russia's internationally recognised borders. Yeah. Uh, Grant has just texted me, Rob, he said, thank God you got Robert back, Sean. Suddenly had a terrible thought he might have fallen out of his window. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody wrote to me after the announcement on, well, not the announcement, the information on Friday and said, Robert, please be careful around drinking tea and also admiring the view out of your <laughs> your house over the Pacific Ocean. So I've been very careful since yeah. then. Hey, Robert, lovely to reconnect in 2023. Look forward to, to the next Thanks, time sure. we chat. Thank you. That is uh, Robert, Professor Robert Patman, who, boy, does a great job keeping us up to date, uh, particularly on areas in the Ukraine, but on international affairs.